Um, and we've been focusing our work more and more on skills and opportunities in recent years. And that comes from two angles, I guess, thinking how we can ensure that all Londoners can access the opportunities that come uh, from being in such a dynamic global city, but also thinking how the city can respond to a period of huge disruption, uh, be that from automation, uh, mm. from Brexit, from policy pressure for good work, um, and now from COVID-19. Um, we all can see how hard London has been hit by COVID-19. Uh, there are a million uh, workers on furlough in the capital, that's, and 30% of workers are either on furlough, um, unemployed, or working reduced hours. Um, some London sectors look quite resilient. Some of the business services sectors are operating um, quite well under this new normal. But some of the least resilient sectors are some of those um, which have the most low paid and precarious employment, retail, accommodation and food, parts of arts and entertainment. So as well as pushing up unemployment when uh, furlough ends, COVID-19 may well accelerate other disruptive trends, um, decline of legacy sectors, um, automation, refocus on different types of services. Um, and that creates a big challenge for workers, particularly some of those who are lowest paid and perhaps least able to adapt easily, and also uh, risks creating a very blighted start to their working life for a whole generation of young people. So this afternoon, I think, couldn't come at a more important time. Um, there's a, um, a huge challenge in thinking how uh, further education can help Londoners adapt and respond uh, to what's going to be a choppy few years. And I hope this will set the scene uh, for further discussions on that and further discussions um, in coming years, particularly we want to focus more work on how um, young people can be helped. Um, format's going to be, we'll hear a presentation from uh, my colleague Nicola, one of the research, one of the um, authors of the report. And then we'll have uh, comments from our four, uh, our three panelists, and then audience questions and comments. Um, if you want to start putting questions in now, uh, please feel free to do so. You can use the Q&A box if you're watching on Zoom, or you can use Twitter using the hashtag LDN responds. Um, and that's also the hashtag for any related tweets. Um, if you do use the Q&A function in Zoom, um, I will read your name out if I can see it. Um, so if you want to remain anonymous, um, please use the anonymous option which exists. And we'll try and get through as much as we can um, before 5 p.m. So I won't introduce the panel now. I'll just turn to Nico and ask, uh, Nico, could you give an overview of the uh, research findings? Thank you, Richard. Uh, yes, you should all be able to see my screen now. Um, so I'm going to be speaking um, for 10 minutes um, and I will be first going through why London needs a further education more than, more than ever uh, and then what challenges most need addressing in London. Uh, where we are in terms of policy changes and then offer some recommendations. And I assume you can, you can hear me okay. Um, so I think starting by definition, official definitions of further education usually describe it by the negative as non-university learning. And this hides the fact that FE has three really vital missions uh, to teach essential skills, to improve access to employment, um, offer opportunities to break into occupations requiring technical knowledge, and provide opportunities for personal and professional development. In other words, uh, employment support, vocational education, and continuous learning, both for young people and for adult career changers. And um, further, it's best to say that educate, further education is on the front line when it comes to tackling the two greatest challenges on, that London's labour market is facing. The first one is um, the pay penalty that workers without qualifications face in London. As you can see on this chart, median pay is only 3% higher in London for people without qualifications than it is in the rest of the UK. And that compares to 24% for people who have GCSE or equivalent qualifications. And that's even though the cost of living is much higher in London. We also know that qualified workers are much more likely to receive 
um, further training throughout their working lives uh, than unqualified workers, kind of entrenching that, that pay penalty. So on the graph here, London um, is uh, the yellow bar. And the more you move up the charts, um, the more qualifications uh, people have. The second challenge is in the waves of disruption that um, will be in our reconfiguring London's labor market. One of these waves, of course, is already hitting us, and that's the brutal increase in unemployment uh, that London, like the rest of the UK, is facing. Uh, we, all ha we all have our eyes uh, on these numbers on, and on the furlough numbers that have come in today, but we know that over 100,000 people um, are unemployed already in have been made and employed in, in the space of the last couple of months. And then there's immigration reform that's around the corner and London looks vulnerable given its share of EEA workers, 15% of the workforce. And uh, combined, these are likely to be intensifying changes in the nature of work. Uh, we know that um, automation will be leading to job displacement in the capital. Uh, and previous research by Centre for London found that one in three jobs in London have a high potential for automation. Um, but London, and I think this is the key message of the report, London will struggle to meet these challenges of equal opportunity and coronavirus response unless it can um, kind of tackle three key issues uh, with the further education system. And I'm going to go uh, through this in turn. The first one is uh, overall participation. The second one is opportunities for progression into mid to higher level courses or training. And the third one is responsiveness to skill shortages. So the first challenge is that London is entering the recession with an atrophied further education system. Uh, participation in further education among those of working age has fallen by 40% since 2014-15. On the job training has fallen too, um, and that means that despite the record-breaking numbers of Londoners who go to university every year, fewer of us engage in learning. Uh, and this is according to an annual survey of learning conducted by the Learning and Work Institute, 28% uh, of Londoners said they've engaged in some form of learning in the last three years, down from an average of 45% in the 2000s. Now, much of this decrease can be traced back to reduced funding entitlements for learners. Um, and as a consequence, colleges have had to reduce teacher pay and increase class sizes. Um, and that's opened a real discrepancy between you know, policy ambitions uh, and the mission of further education that we've discussed before, uh, and the means that are allocated to realize that mission. The second uh, key issue is um, the rarity of progression routes. With provision stripped back, as we've just seen, uh, London's training offer is focused on basic skills. Um, and as you can see on this chart, um, this is the number of funded learners uh, by level of learning um, in education and training. So this excludes apprenticeships and this excludes um, adult community learning. Uh, three quarters of, of funded learners here are preparing for a qualification that is at level two or below. Uh, so that's GCSE equivalent. And nearly all of them, 99% are, um, entering for a qualification that's level three or below, equivalent to A-levels. Um, so while this basic skills are absolutely essential, it does mean that there are few routes to progress um, into mid-level or higher technical qualifications. And perhaps um, that helps understand why, um, if you have the resource to do it, it's very tempting to just go for uh, an academic qualification at university. Um, added to that, London makes little use of the apprenticeship scheme, at least relative to other regions. Um, 
And as you can see on the chart, um, in the last year, there has been, there were half as many apprenticeship starts per 10,000 jobs in London as there were in other regions. Uh, so there really is a lot of an issue here. Um, and the hope that the apprenticeship levy, which was introduced a few years ago now, would be a step change in opportunities for young people hasn't really materialized. Some analysis by colleagues at Resolution Foundation has shown that quality of apprenticeships has markedly improved, but the number of opportunities hasn't. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the blue and yellow lines are four under 25, um, and they've been plateauing at best and falling in recent years. And the third key challenge is how we respond to skill shortages. Um, even in the last five years, uh, at a time when London was seeing rapid growth in sectors such as human health, social work, construction, digital, uh, hospitality, and of course, professional services. Um, even in that context, learner numbers in corresponding subject areas have not kept pace with this demand. Uh, as you can see on this chart, numbers have um, remain, have fallen or remained flat uh, for most corresponding subject areas. Uh, there have been some increase, and it's worth noting, for instance, in digital sector and um, um, and in engineering slightly, and in construction more notably. And it's worth noting that these are thanks to sustained investment in digital skills and in construction skills, both from uh, the public sector and also from the industry. So I'm going to quickly go over some recent changes. Um, just to show a kind of a map of where we are. Uh, the first kind of really um, important uh, change is the merger of colleges, uh, which has been encouraged by government uh, since 2015, uh, with the aim of it was to avoid doubling up provision, uh, especially in London, where uh, there is a high density of colleges, which is a good thing. Uh, the second is uh, that since September 2019, the mayor controls the spend on the uh, adult skills budget and, um, and already has made changes. I'm sure we'll go over them later, but uh, for instance, um, extending uh, free course tuition for people earning uh, below the London living wage. Um, T-levels will be coming in. These are two-year two courses uh, that feature work placement and um, recently, the apprenticeship promise by government that uh, I think last week or recent, uh, that um, every young person like, will be guaranteed um, an apprenticeship. So uh, that raises a lot of questions about what will happen in the funding for that. But I will just finish by proposing some actions to tackle these three challenges. Um, the first one is about money uh, and is to resource the sector um, and resource it in a way that matches the scale of the challenge that we're facing. So um, there's more detail on this in the report, uh, but broadly we recommend uh, increased teaching grants, um, focusing on areas of skill shortages, as well as free tuition for learners studying for their first qualification, uh, if it's a level two, level three, and a, if it's a higher level course, uh, a lifelong uh, learning loan allowance uh, that learners can draw on. Um, we think that these will be essential to uh, kind of increasing demand and give also colleges and learners more latitude over their training. And for these, we're uh, very much echoing the recommendations that were made by the OGAR review. The second action is to map the barriers in accessing and progressing in further education uh, and the ways to support learners into further education to ensure that um, the sector really serves the purpose of an elevator, economic elevator to people. Uh, the third is that the mayor should um, ensure that, as they now have control of funding rules, that these uh, encourage providers to expand their provision in areas of skills shortages and also work with, with employers and, um, and that colleges can live in uh, a less hand-to-mouth way. 
Um, and finally, um, we think that uh, devolution of um, further education budget in full uh, would be really helpful to provide a strategic oversight over um, further education skills provision. And that could happen. I mean, a few people have drawn maps of how that could happen. For instance, our colleagues at the Learning and Work Institute, um, for instance, the agreements between central and local government covering several years. Um, so that's it from me, and I'll pass it back on to you, Richard. Nico, thank you very much. Sorry, the screen moved, so I lost my unmute button. Um, thank you very much for that overview um, and really good sort of digest of the of the situation, I think, there. Um, we've got a great panel this afternoon um, and we're going to ask each of them to say a few words now. Um, we have with us uh, Mary Vine Morris, who's director of the London Region for Association of Colleges. We've got Anthony Impey, who, as well as being founder of Optimity, is a chair of the Mayor's Apprenticeship Advisory Group and chair of the DFE's Apprenticeship Stakeholder Board. Um, and Michelle Quimabora from City Hall, who's Director of Skills and Employment, well, from City Hall, theoretically, at the Great London Authority. City Hall, as we just, just discussed, is uh, quite quiet right now. So I'm going to turn to um, Mary first and ask, um, it seem remiss, not in the middle of the crisis, not to ask how colleges are coping at the moment, um, how they're preparing for the next year, um, and how you're adapting provision, but also perhaps to um, reflect on the report and what colleges need uh, to respond to the crisis and to get the right priorities in place and any thoughts particularly on what you need from the mayor and, mayor and government. So five minutes for all that, um, over to you. Thank, thank you, Richard. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and be brief. <laughs> um, so I think unsurprisingly, and I don't think colleges are any different from many of the businesses in London, unsurprisingly, um, organisations have been hit uh, really significantly by what's gone on in the last few months. Um, actually, can we say a few months? It, it does just about qualify as a few months, doesn't it? It feels even longer. Um, and similarly to lots and lots of organisations have proved themselves to be amazingly adaptive uh, while sort of struggling with a completely unforeseen set of circumstances. Uh, Colleges have um, managed to hold together their college communities, uh, their learners, their staff and their wider role um, have committed and continued their commitment to learners and learner outcomes um, and also made a significant role in terms of their um, civic contribution. So whether that's running food banks, helping NHS staff, returning staff to, um, you know, to, to the front line. So they have proved to be amazingly adaptive. And like, like, like a lot of things, and I'm sure it's been commented by all of us probably whilst I'm having our, our virtual cups of tea or glasses of wine with our, um, our friends and colleagues. It's amazing how you do make shifts so quickly when it was always so difficult beforehand. So all the questions about it was impossible to work from home. Suddenly we find everybody has managed to work from home. Um, colleges similarly have struggled to be quite honest with um, the whole concept of blended learning and online learning um, for many many years um, and yet it's managed to switch that on pretty much overnight um, we've had a huge continuation of learning and learners um, engaged with reports of increased learning in some instances and some of the things that we're looking at quite um, quite carefully at the moment to see what lessons have learned because um, we've all said it we, we won't go back completely to the way things were before um, and neither should we so um so some actually really positive things are coming out of this already, but not without its um, its challenges, challenges, lots of challenges around uh, around learners, about their mental health, around their staff, but also particularly some um, financial duress that uh, that the sector finds itself under. So accepting everything Nicholas has said about how difficult college, financial situation colleges were in already, um, then add to that where we are at the moment. So you have a sector which ranges from a dependency on, on government funding from typically say 95, 90, or, you know, certainly high 90% um, if you're in a sixth form college through to some colleges who only rely on government funding for something like 40% of their, um, their provision and the rest is um, commercial income, international students, um, fee income, uh, apprenticeships, etc. So you can imagine the, um, the different effects that that's had. So whilst um, the government and even more quickly, the mayor and his team came out with some huge uh, reassurances about certainty of funding going forward for the current year and the next year um, around government funding. Um, the rest of it places the sector in a very, very difficult uh, situation. Um, 
And I think the other thing that's particularly hitting um, colleges at the moment is um, and again, I don't think we're different from business. Um, uncertainty of planning. What will student behaviours be like come the new academic year, even if they have the option to go back to back to college in terms of on site learning? Will they choose to? Will they want to take that risk? Will they do the journeys that they've previously done? Will they travel past the college that's at the end of their road um, because they want to get to the college of their choice because it has a better reputation or the opportunity for them to reinvent themselves, having left the school that they were um, you know, that they've done their um, statutory education in, particularly for young people. So learning behaviour is, um, is a huge question for us. And it does make for some sort of uncertainty in planning. Nevertheless, I think colleges really clearly see themselves. Um, we see ourselves as having an absolute key role in terms of both social and economic recovery in the capital. There is no question about it, the sorts of challenges that are being expressed at the moment. Colleges are absolutely there um, at the centre of it. Colleges, I would suggest, can't necessarily drive the business growth and recovery that we're going to need. Um, what we can do is complement that with the skills that, um, that are going to be required and the different skills that are being required. And whilst appreciating what the report shows in terms of the stretch between um, um, demand and supply, a challenge which has, always, has been with us for an awfully long time and isn't going to go away, nevertheless, we have a role in trying to respond to that. So I think for us, what we see is the uh, key challenges of, um, of young people having less opportunities, certainly um, we'll come on to it, but less apprenticeship opportunities and having to deal with um, issues of lost learning, important periods of, um, of time that they should have been um, um, studying, even those who have studied, particularly those in vocational technical qualifications, have lost those practical opportunities. 16 to 18 year olds, 16 to 25 year olds, sorry, potentially being crowded out of a, of a job market um, with, you know, lots of people competing for less and different um, jobs um, and adults requiring retraining to move to sectors, some of which may be um, growing um, at the moment and some of which may be re um, recovering more quickly than others. Um, so, so some real challenges and we have got asks, we've got specific asks of, of government and asks of the mayor in terms of um, support, support for colleges, um, support for learners um, in order to uh, make up for some of the, the learning deficits that, that will have occurred and the new ways of teaching and learning. Um, additional provision and program for programs for, uh, for adults and flexibilities and funding. And we're trying to be quite realistic. There's an awful lot of people asking for, for more money at the moment. Um, uh, what we're what we're trying to do is say where is it that we where do we need more money and where do we need more flexibility and have and sort of having quite a sensible ask and where we do need additional funding where can we identify funding that's already been bought promised by government but can actually be brought forward and utilised more quickly and it's in some of those areas that we're having discussions some with government um, some with the GLA about you know what can be offered in terms of colleges moving forward. That's probably all I'm allowed to say in my five minutes, but hopefully we'll have the opportunity to explore some of the other aspects of the report later, later on and through questioning. Thank that, you, Richard. A, thank you. That's recovered an incredible uh, amount. Thank you very much. Anthony, can I turn to you? Um, and again, allowing you only five minutes to say something about, uh, you know, from a uh, businessman's perspective uh, of the role of further education responding to the crisis, but also maybe to focus in on apprenticeships. The Prime Minister has made this big apprenticeship guarantee I don't think we've seen a lot of detail about it yet. How does that work? We know that London has low take up of apprenticeships, as Nico said. How does that work in a city like London? How do we get the balance between demand for higher level skills, but also using apprenticeships as, a, as an elevator, as a uh, route for people to progress? Anthony, your thoughts? <laughs> Thank you, Richard, and, and thank you for the um, report findings, uh, Nico. I think there's some really interesting things in there that, that really help paint the landscape and, and highlight some of the challenges that we're, we're facing. Um, I, I think the first thing that I, I want to talk about is, is really to um, paint quite a grim picture of the challenges that businesses uh, are facing at the moment. I think everybody uh, is uh, having to make difficult decisions within their organisations. Um, both small businesses and large businesses, I think, are all, are all feeling the impact of the crisis. And I think it's... Um, it's, it's understandable, you know, we, we see, we're, we're beginning to see some of the indicators of the scale of the challenge and, um, you know, the, the, the number of people who are furloughed, um, the rising numbers of people um, claiming universal uh, credits, um, the report yesterday from the OECD about the uh, UK economy shrinking by over 12%, the, the 
the worst in the league table of um, OECD countries. So, uh, and, and in that context, you know, businesses are, are having a tough time. And certainly uh, many of the uh, business owners uh, that I have spoken to over the last um, few weeks and months uh, are, are fighting, fighting for survival. And, um, uh, you know, they're finding things very tough. And, and unfortunately, I think things are going to stay tough for an awfully long time. And, and uh, I think we're likely to see um, the rate of business failures increase uh, in the last quarter of this year and the first quarter of next as government subsidies fall away and tax deferments become due. So um, I think that's the, that's the challenge that um, businesses face. And so I think there is always uh, a difficulty when, when businesses are in such um, challenging uh, commercial circumstances. There's always a challenge to uh, approach businesses to say, we know you're going through these tough times, but you know, can you um, help uh, the, uh, the economy by recruiting some apprentices, for example? Because for a lot of organizations, the, 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 the priority, the only thing that they're working on is, you know, how do they keep their business intact? How do they keep their existing staff uh, employed? Um, and yet at this time, we're, we're, during any kind of economic slowdown, uh, investing in uh, your long-term future as an organization, I think is one of the key features of uh, an organizations that come out of uh, economic downturn uh, as more successful entities. And, and the thing with, with any kind of economic disruption is that while um, it does lead to very, very difficult um, situations for people who are both employed and for employers, uh, it is also a time of uh, immense opportunity because the economy is going through a process of change and uncertainty in itself creates new opportunities uh, as, as um, uh, sectors shift and change and transform. And, and Mary, you mentioned about how uh, the um, further education uh, sector suddenly became digitized, having talked about it for a number of years, suddenly in the process of about two weeks, it became a digitized sector. So, so I think that's, uh, I just want to kind of paint that picture of, you know, these are tough times for businesses. And so any ask of businesses around engaging more in apprenticeships needs to be put in that context of, of tough conditions and tough conditions for the foreseeable future. And um, I think um, uh, regarding the uh, PM's pledge around apprenticeships, I think um, it, it's clearly lacking details. I've not yet spoken to anybody who has any details. So if anybody knows any details uh, that's listening to this, please um, let us know. But, but, I think, but I think, you know, on a positive side, I think it highlights that um, the government sees apprenticeships as part of the national recovery effort and investing in skills is seen as, a, as an important part of what we need to do to rebuild uh, the economy. So I think that is, a, that is, a, that is absolutely uh, positive. And I think it's also um, encouraging that the uh, Prime Minister is talking about it uh, to enable young people to start their careers. I think there is a real danger that without that very focused intervention, we will end up with uh, people stuck in long-term unemployment and scarring in our um, communities, uh, not, not, and not just our economy, if, if we don't help those uh, young people start their careers. Um, I think if, if I was to, if, if, um, if Boris was to call me now and say, you know, I'd like some details, can you, can you help me with those details? There, there are probably three things that I would say are, are important to, to add around this. One is that I think we need to uh, help small businesses in particular um, uh, recover from this, uh, from this uh, recession that we're going into. Uh, and the sooner that we can do that, the better. And so I think any, any initiative around uh, improving and targeting apprenticeships needs to target apprenticeships in small businesses. I think the second is that we need to uh, improve our track record of diversity in apprenticeships um, to, to where we are at the moment. And, and I have to say, London has done a great job when you compare uh, London's performance and London's diversity track record compared to uh, other parts of the country. Uh, but we could do so much uh, better and we could do so much more. And so I think, you know, embedding diversity into, into um, 
the, the pledge would be uh, would be critical. And then the third uh, element is I think we need to think about apprenticeships as a um, as the start of a progression through lifelong learning. And I think it's it's you know it's it's disheartening that in the past that we haven't been very good at. Um, starting people on a an, on an apprenticeship journey, maybe on a, on a level two a GCSE equivalent or a level three an A level equivalent, and that is a pathway to progression. I think there's some indication, you know, there's some positive signs of that, and certainly, you know, the the large increase in the number of people doing degree level apprenticeships certainly points to a a, a system that is helping people to progress to higher level skills. But I think we need to do much better at that in order to take people through that progression. Because I think if we achieve those three things, if we target small businesses, if we improve our track record on diversity, and we, we create a system that has this progression that really helps people start a journey of lifelong learning, we, we will end up in a better place than where we were uh, a few months ago in, in the era that I call the olden days now. Um, but was 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 barely three months ago, and, and I think that 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 approach of building back better has to be has to be the thing that that London um, becomes famous for when when people are talking about this era and what we did uh, as a result of this crisis. Brilliant! Uh, thank you very much, Anthony. We're getting some good questions coming in already about support from people from minority groups um, about. Uh, funding for next year about T levels, about targeted growth. So keep those coming and we'll start uh, addressing those after we've heard a few words from Michelle, who likes to talk about, I suppose, the view from uh, the mayor's office, the biggest challenges as they, as you see them uh, for London's skills provision and labour market coming out of COVID-19. Um, what progress has been made with the AEB so far and what prospects there are for further devolution and change? Again, a huge amount of things to talk about in five minutes. So I'll take three huge questions there. Um, so I think when we talk about challenges, I think it's almost flipping it around. So what aren't the challenges um, that we're now facing? I think it's probably it's probably easier to list what aren't because there aren't many things that aren't challenges. I mean, I think there are the challenges in different ways. Covid um, in itself as a health crisis has um, proved probably the, the biggest challenge that we never saw coming. Um, we probably uh, thought there was going to be some kind of recession at some point. We know Brexit is looming. So, you know, there was quite a lot of preparation going into um, no deal Brexit planning. But the thing that we never planned for uh, was the uh, you know complete closure of our FE system in terms of the physical infrastructure and buildings. Um, and I remember sitting in a meeting actually with Mary and um, other FE college principals probably about two weeks before we had um, the sort of an announcement around college closure. And even then, I don't think we really thought uh, that we would be in a situation where the whole of the economy would be stopped in that way. So uh, look, I think the mayor has been very clear that um, COVID is absolutely the biggest challenge we probably um, ever, will ever face. Um, during, certainly during his mayoralty, but beyond. Um, and there's a number of things that, that we've already done um, in response to that. So about two weeks ago, although it could be longer, because as Mary said, time just is, is nebulous at the moment, uh, the, mayor, <laughs> the mayor launched uh, the £9 million COVID response fund, and that is aimed at FE colleges and other um, FE providers. And that's really to support those providers to adapt their online provision. As we've heard from all the speakers so far, a tremendous strides have happened overnight in ways that we could probably would never have achieved had we not had a pandemic. Um, but there are um, obviously areas that are, are still struggling and need additional capacity and support. And the mayor is uh, committed to doing that, uh, as well as trying to ensure that um, we are able to support those that are digitally excluded because I think that has become we always knew digital exclusion, exclusion was a big issue but I think that has become an even bigger issue um, over the last few weeks where we are all now digital. Um, we also know that uh, the, the sort of health implications of COVID are disproportionately affecting our Bain communities in particular and that uh, that is of particular importance in how we shape uh, moving forward and how we shape the recovery and, and as we starting to call it a city hall the renewal actually it's not just about recovery but it's um, uh, not going back to the way we were it's renewing and taking um, the real lessons that we've learned through this forward so how can we support our uh, BAME communities uh, through further education in particular um, and support them into the labour market or progress within the labour market during a recession. 
It's also um, really important that we don't we don't forget things like zero carbon economy. And actually, I think that also provides um, an absolute thread of the work that City Hall is thinking about at the moment. In fact, we have sort of three key planks when we talk about renewal and recovery. One is around um, the health implications, uh, the other around um, diversity and inequality. And the third is around uh, that zero carbon um, renewal and recovery. And how can we tackle uh, that through any of the planning and any of the, the work work that we do moving forward. Um, since I think the other thing to say is you sort of mentioned devolution in your, um, your introduction and, and devolution is actually at the heart of all of this. So I think the, the adult education budget and the mayor has always been very clear that it's just the start. Um, and I think uh, what has uh, what we've dem able, been able to demonstrate working with our partners and, and we have worked incredibly closely with colleges, um, private training providers, the voluntary sector, business groups over the last few weeks, probably um, talking to them more than we would do normally um, to try and um, provide a collective response to how we can use the AEB and respond quickly, uh, both to support the financial kind of um, constraints of uh, institutions and ensuring that there's stability there, but also about how can we tackle some of the issues that we've known about for some time and that have been amplified by this crisis. Um, and we have been developing policy on the hoof, I think it's fair to say, um, and we will continue to do that over the next uh, few weeks and months as we move through. But the other thing it has done is it's brought uh, skills absolutely to the top of the agenda when you talk about devolution. So the mayor and um, the other metro mayors, so the M9, have um, been meeting very frequently over the last uh, few weeks and months, probably more frequently than they ever did before because it took a lot of um, organisation to get them in a room. Now they just have to click on a on a, a Zoom call to, to have that conversation. And um, skill, they have spoken to the Prime Minister directly about skills. Uh, they have, uh, I think just this week, had meetings with HMLG and uh, with the Gillian, the skills minister, about the importance of skills in the recovery uh, and uh, the, me the, sorry, Get, the, get this wrong, the Prime Minister, not the Mayor, has um, been very uh, clear about the role of mayors in recovery. Uh, they are also meeting the Chancellor in the next uh, week or so, and we've been working very closely with um, DfE to ensure that uh, we are unified in the asks for effectively more funding across all of these areas to uh, respond to the challenges that we're facing. So um, I think it in some ways, I mean, it, it's fairly horrific, the situation we find ourselves in, and there are a huge number of challenges. But I think, as Anthony and Mary have said as well, there's huge opportunity that we can take from this. Um, and some of the things we've learned, and also some of the doors that have been opened, perhaps with government around having these discussions, uh, we need to seize that opportunity and make sure that we don't lose it through this um, situation. Great. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a few questions that come in, uh, so I'm going to jump straight in. I, um, uh, three of them around um, a uh, really crucial topic right now about people from minority backgrounds. Um, and I think there are three questions there. One was about what additional support can we put in place for young people from particular minority ethnic backgrounds, those with special needs, uh, special educational needs, and those with other complex needs who are um, over all overrepresented among uh, people young people are not in employment, education or training. Um, I think related, related to that is um, challenges faced by people with uh, disabilities in accessing education and the question from Caroline Hunt about how women and minority groups can be better supported. Um, Caroline also uh, commented on the uh, lack of gender and ethnicity breakdown in some of the stats. And I might ask Nico to say a word about that after some of the policy issues. Um, and also a question about uh, diversity in apprenticeships. Um, I think picking up from a point that Anthony made, um, how good is diversity in London when it comes to apprenticeships? Um, and how well do people progress from minority backgrounds from apprenticeships to um, sustained and gainful employment? So perhaps just I could ask um, Mary to make some remarks about how we can um, support people from different groups to access education, how we can ensure level playing field and accessing FE. To go, ask Nico just to reflect on um, the availability of data on uh, different groups and how he found that during the research. And then Anthony, maybe to say something specific on apprenticeships. Uh, I will try not to ask everyone to answer every question, but they're just quite a range there. So um, perhaps uh, Mary first, Nico, then Anthony. 
Shall I, shall I just kick off then? Yeah. So um, absolutely right. Uh, those those uh, young people, those communities are are overrepresented in in NEAT. Uh, they're also overrepresented in colleges already. Um, so our colleges already have a much higher proportion of um, of uh, BAME students and um, and young people with SEND um, and disabilities more generally. Um, within their college communities. And that's quite often when we look at things like, I noticed one of the interesting stats that Nico um, provided was about um, how well, uh, it's, and it's generally said, how well schools are doing compared with how well colleges are doing. We still have 40% um, of young people leaving school who don't have their five GCSEs, in, in, including English and maths. Um, and most of those come to college. Um, so what we need is a good, well-funded FE system which responds to the needs of all young people and adults. Um, we've continued very much to try and invest in young people and you'll see that um, when you do look at the sort of funding reductions it's tended to hit adults um, disproportionately and adult opportunities disproportionately so we have a lot less part-time opportunities than we used to um, we have a, a, a narrower curriculum than we used to um, so that's not to say that there isn't more that needs to be done because it absolutely does need to be done and when you look at things like progression and particularly progression into work and progression into things like apprenticeship um, that's where we have real causes for concern because those outcomes aren't always equal um, and you can you know you can guess where the inequalities lie because they live uh, you know across that um, and it tends to match where our learners come from because they come from disadvantaged communities thank you Nico um, just just to add that um, we know we know much less about the outcomes of um, students coming out of the further education system than we do about people who come out of university. Uh, and I think this is being addressed and the GLA is doing uh, kind of out research on outcomes. Uh, so we will know more about this. Uh, and at the moment, I think it's a, it's a blind spot. And I think it reflects just the inequality of resource between further education and higher education that we've been living with and um, as Mary said, with um, it's almost 40% of young learners not going to university, uh, at least in, in, in after leaving school and in their 20s, then um, these people will be predominantly uh, um, will be facing deprivation. And so uh, we will really need to do more research on their outcomes. Um, so, yeah, that's definitely a point that I'd be interested in working more on after this, after this report. Michelle, you want to jump in there? Yeah, I was just going to come in on that. Um, so I think there's two things um, that City Hall is doing. Um, one is uh, we made a commitment when we took on the adult education budget to publish far more data than um, the DfE have published in the past. Um, we may well regret that, I guess, when we publish the data. <laughs> but um, we we are in literally today. We have finalised the data that we will be publishing, um, and we will be producing that information. Um, I think it will be on the data store, but on the GLA websites, and there'll be a significant amount of information in there, um, which will include those sort of breakdowns around gender um, and everything else. And we have been working closely with um, the. Uh, the Skills for Londoners board, which includes FE colleges and others, uh, to agree what data we would publish there. So I think that hopefully um, is a step forward and, and obviously the Mayor's commitment about openness and transparency. The second thing also to, just to pick up is around the outcomes work that we're doing. Um, and it is, I think, universally recognised that we don't quite know what happens to people or we could know, but it's um, through the sort of Leo data and that has significant time lags and everything else. So again, the Skills for Londoners board has been working on a range of outcomes um, and the mayor is in the process of um, working through a learner survey that we would be launching uh, to try and record some of those outcomes uh, with the individuals that are, uh, undertake firstly the adult education budget, but with the idea that we may well um, widen that out across other funding streams as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Could I ask Anthony to say a couple of words about diversity and apprenticeships, which attracted the attention of one of my colleagues, actually, Deneen, who raised that question. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, as I said, you know, that London's London's doing OK, but it needs to do a lot more to get diversity right. And, um, you know, I think there are, there are a number of initiatives, including the um, Workforce Integration Network, 
that is um, helping uh, young black men start careers in the construction sector and the digital sector. And I think that kind of targeted intervention is, is what is required in order to, to really boost um, the uh, reach of, of apprenticeships. I also think there's quite an important piece around making apprenticeships much more aspirational. And I think for a long time, they've been the, um, the poor, poor relative to uh, studying a degree at university. And um, I think we need to, to move away from that perception. And I think, again, degree apprenticeships have done a great job at doing that. But I also suspect that as we go into kind of these more challenging times, uh, employers are going to be much more interested with uh, much, much, much more interested in hiring people with with the relevant skills and, and qualifications that are that match what they need as an organization. And so I, I suspect that what we will see in the next three years is, is a real change in um, how young people uh, approach uh, apprenticeships. In fact, everybody, you know, apprenticeships is, is not just um, something for young people, it's, it's for people across the workforce. And I suspect that we'll see a change as um, people can identify a connection between doing an apprenticeship and, and getting better work. And I think that's a, quite an important part of how do we, how do we build more diverse apprenticeships. It's, it's quite important that apprenticeships become a more attractive uh, option than, than other alternatives. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I've got a couple, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm conscious of time, but we've got two questions. We've got some questions about the learner experience, which I'll come to uh, Mary in particular about in a, in a minute. But first of all, a couple of people have picked up on points made by Michelle and other points um, on the zero carbon economy. Um, a question from Graham Peterson, uh, how can we equip the current and future workforce with the skills needed to deliver a zero carbon economy? And for those who are interested, there's a TUC report he's um, put up in the chat. Um, and a similar question uh, from uh, Jim Coleman, should the government be doing more to support the FE sector to stimulate targeted growth sectors, especially helping skills development for low carbon tech stroke industry and to facilitate the drive to net zero by 2050? And I suppose a question, and perhaps I'm going to ask uh, Michelle and Anthony to say something on this one. To what extent sh should we be trying to pick the right sectors and really take a strategic view that we need to really focus new skills, particularly in green and net zero uh, tech? Michelle first, maybe. Um, well, I mean, certainly this is this is a sort of ambition of the mayors to, to really focus on that zero uh, carbon economy. And I think the question we're right at the beginning of this, I think, is probably the answer. Um, we we knew this was something that we would be thinking about anyway. But I think, again, that the, the situation we found ourselves in has really sped up um, the thinking and um, what can we do about it now? I don't think we're in the position to pick winning sectors at the moment. Um, and I think uh, we're right at the beginning of what could be quite a deep uh, recession. Uh, but what we can do is look to incentivize different, um, different types of qualification or different types of um, modules or anything else within that, which have this focus. I think we, we've certainly had discussions with the Association of Colleges and other providers that are starting to dip their toe in the water on this. And I think it's something we need to uh, ramp up probably our activity on. Is it probably a, a waffly way of answering that? But it's certainly something we need to do and we're probably not quite there yet. That's great. I'm just going to recount a slightly sharp comment that's come up through the Q&A there, which is that the GLA's recent environment strategy didn't include a link to the GLA strategy for skills. So someone's saying there, the two, the bits need to be joined up. I'm Absolutely. It on. <laughs> um, Anthony, um, your thoughts on how far we should be trying to target uh, sectors like this? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. And I think uh, it's going to be one of the, one of the really big challenging questions that uh, policymakers are gonna need to address over the next, uh, next few months and next few years. Um, I suspect that what we what we really need to be looking at is data uh, and really looking at what the data tells us about where there are gaps in the skills that are required and the employment opportunities and i know that there is work being done within the gla to to look at precisely that i also wonder whether um we need to shift our thinking away from job roles and uh, onto skills and actually looking at the, looking at uh, the skills profile of uh, individuals and targeting skills development uh, on a on a learner by learner basis, rather than just mapping 
individual, you know, rather than the mapping journeys into particular careers, actually look at uh, much more uh, granular information around the skills that that uh, somebody uh, has. And, and um, this is uh, some thinking, in fact, developed by the McKinsey Global Institute around how um, skills profiles uh, in, in seemingly very, very different roles um, are actually very, very similar. So the, the example in the research, McKinsey's research says that a school administrator has all the skills, uh, has the skill, exactly the same skills profile as somebody who is a IT business analyst. And the difference in salary is, uh, I think the average salary for a, a school administrator is uh, 20,000 pounds and the average salary for an IT business analyst is 58,000 pounds. And so the, 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 the thinking there is actually, can we do more with the data that we have available to really map people's skills so that they have a, a skill set that is transferable between different sectors. And I think this is this is this addresses the big challenge around how do we equip people with the relevant skills for the green economy? Because there's not enough jobs in the green economy for us to build a huge workforce today, but we definitely need to build the skills in the economy today in order to be ready for that change in the economy. So I think you know, thinking about skills and thinking about how we build people's skills profile is a fantastic way for us to, to be in the right place and have the right resources and have the right skills infrastructure. So as these new sectors open up, we've, we've got the workforce that's, that's ready to go and, and, and has the relevant skills. Brilliant. And we, we found something very similar in some work we did on automation a couple of years ago, that it's those broad, quite often interpersonal skills that people need in a whole range of jobs, rather than maybe deep um, technical skills, which couldn't quite often be automated now. Can I ask two questions now about um, learner experience, um, both actually from Holly Smith. One about um, the capacity to deliver the vocational side of T-levels, which is presumably only going to be more challenging now. What's needed to ensure learners get this vocational experience from T-levels should T-levels be delayed? And on a similar uh, note, how are colleges adapting teaching for subjects that really need that face-to-face -face and practical uh, teaching, things like construction? Do we need a plan for those learners to go back first? Mary, perhaps, and uh, we're quite short on time now, but perhaps you could pick up on both of those for a moment or two. Yeah, thank you, Richard. So really briefly, thanks, Holly, um, um, on T-levels. Yeah, government hasn't decided to delay um, T-levels, although it is allowing um, colleges to make a sensible decision about whether they're able to, um, to put them in place. And one of the most obvious things is that the substantive period of work experience will need to be pushed towards the end of their, uh, of their learning experience, because um, that's certainly not going to be there um, in September. Uh, exactly as Anthony said earlier on, we're not, we're not going to be the ones going out to say to employers, oh, and by the way, would you mind giving us a three month work experience placement um, on the on the bit about bringing students back yes we have the capacity to do that and we're already looking at uh, prioritizing which students come in to college so only a few can come in we've got there's there is more guidance than you would you know like shake a stick at um, 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 so a taking that guidance um, at heart, to heart, it means that there have to be very limited amounts of opportunities and learners in on site at any one time. And those that are prioritised are those who've become perhaps more um, uh, disenfranchised from their learning, perhaps have been digitally excluded because of the opportunities at home, or have not been able to because of the practical nature of the skills that they're being taught have that experience. Although we've seen some amazingly creative lecturers who can do things that you would never even have thought of, you know, like I didn't know you could teach, you know, hair and beauty or whatever um, remotely, but but you can. So um, we might not be able to see that in everybody's hairstyles any longer, but you know, <laughs> um, but this is the case. So no, people have been quick quite creative about that but they are needing to be prioritized so we will need that, those opportunities and we will need um, we will actually at some point need the work experience because actually you can only simulate a certain amount of this and you do need to have the real life learning experience but you know we'll be ready to do that brilliant thank you very much um, I'm going to probably take one more question um, and there are a few more coming through so I'm sorry we're not going to be able to get to those but one question, one of the first questions that came in uh, was, Londoners often say that they find the education system too complex and new qualifications are confusing them further. Um, how can we simplify the system so that adults and young people can see how qualifications relate directly to employment? And other people have been asking how job centres can link in better with FE. So, you know, from a, from a Londoner's point of view, what can we do to make the system 
looks simple, looks straightforward. Perhaps I could ask all three to answer on that. Perhaps Anthony first, uh, Michelle, and then Mary. Uh, I mean, it's, it's it's a great question. I, I think my 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 response would be. Um, London's economy is very complicated and so therefore the skill system that supports it is likely to be quite complicated at the, at, as a result. I think what's important is that we make it easy for people to navigate the skill system so that they can understand the relationship between something they're studying and and better work and I think that it's 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 less about making a, a, a vanilla skills uh, system I think it's much more about making it very easy for people to navigate the system and understand that uh, relationship between what they study uh, and the outcome it can produce. Thank you. Uh, Michelle? Yeah, I think um, sort of echoing um, Anthony, really. I mean, it's a really good question. I think it's one we've been grappling with for as long as I've been involved in um, skills, certainly. I mean, one of the things we, we've we done very, very recently is support um, initiative thing uh, such as Keep London Learning, which is a sort of hub uh, for adult uh, community learning provision. It was initially sort of set up by those central London providers, and it's certainly something that we're now supporting and working them with them. I think that's one solution, but it's one of many, and it, and it ties into the sort of careers offer. Um, and uh, the, one of the things the mayor is calling for from government is uh, the sort of careers is um, brought together uh, by the mayor of London so that we can actually start to communicate um, that the pathways, the qualifications um, in a better way to Londoners. Thank you. And uh, Mary? Yeah, I'd I'd re-emphasise the uh, the points as well on on careers, not the old-fashioned idea of um, a, you know twenty-minute interview <laughs> with a careers official, but um, but may, being having the ability to make informed choice about what opportunities there will be, um, and what we found is that actually what you what you are quite often need isn't a necessarily a systematic change or a system-based change. You need to remain a sort of very to have a personalised service, whilst. Um, whilst we've still got colleges in every borough in London, you know, it's, we're in a great position. Whilst, whilst they can be seen as their sort of, uh, as the local um, asset that people can go to and can get actually sensible advice um, on a personalised basis about what opportunities there, that will be an important part of sort of that trust in, in the FE system. But we do know, need to know what those opportunities are going to be going forward um, um, in the future, because actually, in order to inform people right, uh, correctly, in order to be able to put on provision that does uh, meet some of the demands that people have been talking about, you need a sort of a risk sharing basis, particularly to look at new provision in new places where there frequently is not demand. The, re the reason provision is quite often where it is, is because that's what learners are asking for. They're not asking for some of the subjects which we believe that employers may need in five years time. They're asking for something where they can get a job, you know, in six months, in one year and feel confident about it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we're out of um, time now. That's been an incredibly rich conversation. I'm just seeing from the chat and the Q&A that we could talk a lot further about what individual colleges are doing, about... Um, access to support for people that uh, older people in the economy all sorts of different issues we haven't managed to touch on so apologies for that um i think it's it's interesting it's it's been a like a lot of discussions now it's been a picture of uh, doom and gloom and an imminent uh very grim recession that we're all staring uh, staring in the face but also some really positive thoughts on you know the adaptiveness of the sector showing uh, despite the uh troubles it's had over recent years about how it could be used to actually help transform the economy, to focus on particular sectors, but also to focus on a more lifelong, a more skills-based approach, rather than just trying to train people up for the jobs which, in the economy today, make the jobs that you train for today may not be there tomorrow. So actually thinking differently about how FE equips a sort of agile and adaptable workforce seems really important. Um, Obviously, there's more could be done to make it accessible, to make it navigable, to make it understandable for different people. But it seems to be a strong case to be made to government that investing in FE um, and perhaps the integration between FE and HE, it will be vital in actually ensuring resilience and a, a, a swifter recovery as possible. So thank you very much to uh, my panellists, uh, Michelle, uh, Anthony and Mary. Thank you to uh, Nico and Sara for putting the report together. Um, and all my colleagues who've been helping to put this um, event together and communicate the report and design it and all those things. 
Um, thank you in particular to uh, Schroeder Foundation who sponsored the work. Um, Centre for London is a charity. We rely on uh, donations from corporates, trusts and foundations to deliver our work. We have another project we're currently fundraising for on how um, colleges uh, meet the needs of young Londoners, not in employment, education or training. Um, and I think that's an issue that's been raised, particularly with Londoners from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds in, 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 in that uh, group. So we hope to uh, complete fundraising and start work on that soon. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you for uh, joining us and good afternoon. <laughs>